So hello everyone and welcome back to the analysis of economic survey 2021-22. Today we are going to discuss a very crucial topic which is external sectors. Now another name for this topic could be balance of payment. Why is this topic important? According to me this is one of the most crucial topics as far as UPSC is concerned. I'll tell you why. This is a globalized world, right? And we interact with other countries on a continuous basis. India is also said to be a very positive participant in globalization. Now, when we say that we interact with other countries on a continuous basis, what kind of interaction are we talking about? I'll give you some examples. So, for example, we sell goods to other countries. Other countries also sell goods to us. We sell services to other countries. Other countries also sell services to us. Similarly, other countries invest in India. We also invest in other countries. So if you look at these three examples that I have given you, can you categorize these things into, into some solid, solid titles? Yes. So when we talk about interaction with other countries, what are the three things in which we interact? Exchange of goods, we sell goods, we buy goods. Exchange of services, we sell services, we buy services. Similarly, we send capital to other countries, other countries sell, send capital to us. These are some of the ways in which we interact with other countries. Now this chapter examines that in the process of this interaction, how much is the benefit that India is able to derive out of, you know, this interaction with other countries, right? So, so let us examine this chapter from that perspective. Like we always do, so to understand this topic also, I have got a, a chapter plan for you using which we can easily understand how to approach this topic. So see, this is the chapter plan. This I have taken from economic survey and I have changed a few, few things inside this chapter plan also so as to understand this topic in a better manner. So let me show you how the chapter plan or the blueprint of the chapter looks like. So this is called as external sector. In how many parts are we going to divide this topic? We are going to divide this topic into four parts. The first part is called as global trade. Inside global trade, we are going to examine what is the general trend in global trade and what has been the impact of COVID on global trade. This is very, very crucial because see, India is a part of the world. If global trade has been negatively affected, obviously all the countries of the world would be impacted, right? So, so in that context, it is very important to know what has been the trend in the global trade? Now let's come, come to the second part of this topic. The second part of the topic is called as balance of payments. As I told you that another name for external sector could be balance of payment. Now what I have done is I have taken this part because if we understand the basics of balance of payment, I know like most of you understand what is balance of payment. But if we brush up the basic concepts of balance of payments, like what are the components of balance, to balance of payments, where to focus on balance of payment, you know, what are some of the important formulas related to balance of payment, and in fact, what is the meaning of balance of payment. If you are able to understand these things, then it becomes very, very easy to understand what is the trend related to balance of payment in India, right? So first thing that we'll do here is in this section is that we'll go and cover the basics and then we would see what is the trend in balance of payments in India in last one or two years. Now, if we come to the third part, the third part says how resilient is Indian economy? Now here I have changed the topic a bit and I have added a few things in this topic so that you understand what economic survey is trying to tell us. Now, how resilient is Indian economy? It is trying to ask a question that if some crisis-like situation occurs in the world or in India, are we in a condition or situation to handle the crisis boldly and strongly? That is the question that we are asking. Now, how would you know if India is strong enough to face a crisis today? It's very simple. Economic survey says that we are going to look at some of the macroeconomic fundamentals of the economy. If the macroeconomic fundamentals of the economy is strong, we would say that yes, we can face any crisis. So what we have done is, just before describing this section, when, when we are in the second part of this topic called balance of payment, here we are going to discuss a lot of macro fundamentals of the economy. So, so when I teach you this part, when we discuss it, 
keep focusing on the macro fundamentals because when we come to the third part we would use all these things here right so how are we going to approach this question how resilient is indian economy It means how strong is the indian economy to understand that we are going to look at the concept of taper tantrum and i remember that i have already discussed this part in the previous video right then we are going to discuss about a, a very very small section called as fragile 5 of course these two things are not not very positive things uh, it had a negative impact upon india in the year 2013 so we are going to 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 go back to history in the year 2013 and we are going to see how the crisis used to impact us then we would compare that if similar kind of crisis happens today are we in a position to control are we in a position to face it then we are going to understand a few things called as external debt and net international investment position NIIP in the last section of this chapter we are going to understand some of the initiatives by government of India to boost trade so guys this could be a potential UPSC question UPSC might ask you that please describe some of the steps that government of India or policymakers have taken to promote trade or to promote exports in India right so ultimately when you say that we want to promote trade essentially you are trying to promote exports because when you export something when you sell something you will get you know you will get money you will get resources you will get payments right so these are the policies that government of india has taken so as to promote exports i have added a couple of policies here in this list which was not directly given in this topic so here you will find a few changes compared to economic survey so let us start with the first one so see let us see what has been the global trend in terms of trade see whenever you see you whenever you say the word trade what do you mean by that so for example if i say that i am exporting this water bottle to another country so what is the volume of my export one bottle volume means how many units have i exported one one bottle when i say that you know i have exported something to other countries and the value that i got was one dollar what is the meaning of that the meaning of that is i am not talking in terms of the number of units or the quantity i am talking about its monetary value so so when we say that we are exporting one bottle of water to other countries we are talking in terms of volume when we say that our export was worth one dollar we are talking in money terms or monetary terms that is you know export in terms of value or trade in terms of value so similarly whenever we talk about global trade it could be discussed from two perspective global trade in terms of volume means number of units bought and sold and global trade in terms of value which means money value of the trade so so let us see what is the trend globally we are starting from the year 2017 then 2019 2020 2021 let us look at the trend so this this dark line that you see this thick line it is about world trade in terms of value right in terms of money so in terms of value see how the world trade has been it was it was positive between 2017 and 19 then it became negative see and and if you see during covid around covid 2020 there was a big slump see it came down but the world trade started to come down even before covid so but during covid it came down heavily and and you see that there was a slight recovery phase where in value terms the world trade was increasing but again it has started to come down so in value terms after the covid shock that we got the world got if you look at the world trade you see that there is a recovery here but this recovery has also started to come down now so we see a reversal of recovery of world trade in terms of value so upsc might ask you a question that of late in the second half of 2021 do we see a reversal of recovery of world trade in terms of value yes now let's look at world trade in terms of volume right so in terms of volume look at this dotted line red line so in terms of volume the world trade was positive positive it became almost zero and then it started to come down which means it became negative and then it started to recover but again it is coming down 
सो यू ऑब्जर्व टू थिंग्स दैट वर्ल्ड ट्रेड इन टर्म्स ऑफ वॉल्यूम एंड वैल्यू बोथ आर कमिंग डाउन बोथ आर डिक्लाइनिंग राइट which means there must be a very small there must be a very significant reason because of which you see that the world trade in terms of value and volume are coming down there must be something very solid behind it what are some of the important reasons because of which you see that the world trade which should have been increasing it is coming down number 1 so so recent reason that you see is increasing oil prices and energy prices when oil price increases your production becomes costly transportation becomes costly so this is one of the reasons second is container shortage so guys when you export something how do you export most of the time you export using waterways right ships and what do you put in the ship you put containers so the production of container during covid came down because of it the cost of containers increased a lot so that is one of the reasons that world trade has taken a hit freight cost is very high which means that cost of transportation after covid has become very very costly and i told you that the reason is is increasing oil prices lack of availability of containers hence the freight cost which means cost of transportation overall has increased because of these things you see that the world trade in value and volume terms have also been impacted badly right and and here when we talked about world trade we talked about both goods and services so do remember this graph now guys what what was the impact of of covid on world trade in terms of agriculture so in terms of agriculture in terms of mining products in terms of manufacturing products and in terms of fuel products in all these four categories we observed something interesting we observed that in the first quarter which means in the first few months of 2021 there was recovery in these things which means world trade related to agriculture went up mining product went up manufacturing went up fuel product went up everything looked very nice but in the second quarter of 2021 we see that the trade in agriculture mining manufacturing and fuel all these came down that is what we observe and let me show you where we observe this see in 2021 for some time we saw that things were going up and it came down so this is what we have written here right so in terms of manufacturing if somebody asks you the upsc might ask you this question that which of the following sectors you know performed in a positive manner after covid and which of the following sectors could not perform to the potential so see in terms of manufacturing which are the sectors which did well so iron and steel electronics and pharmaceuticals they did well which are the sectors which did not do that well after covid so automobile parts telecom equipment these did not do that well why because in automobile in telecom etc semiconductors are used and globally you see a shortage of semiconductor because of it these manufacturing industries are not doing that well fine so so this was about the world now as i told you that we are going to we are going to divide this topic into four different parts so we are done with the first part now we are back to the second part in the second part we are going to study balance of payment but first i'll teach you the basics of balance of payment through a story right and then we are going to look at the trend of balance of payments in india so see guys what is the meaning of balance of payments now to understand what is the meaning of balance of payment you have to take two things in mind number 1 take take for example india so so let's say that this is india and this is some country of the world let's say for example usa it could be any country now to understand what is the meaning of balance of payment we have to look into a few things so you know from india what are the things that you send to usa goods what are the things that usa sends to you goods along with goods we also sell services to us similarly us also sells services to us similarly we send capital to other countries be it us any or anywhere for example we send money we invest in countries like usa and other countries similarly usa also invests in our country 
so whenever you interact with another country guys in terms of goods services or capital you have to convert all these things into money so for example if i if i export or sell this bottle of water to us and if somebody will ask me that what was the value of the trade so i will say that the price of this bottle was $1. When I sold it to US, USA gave me $1. So $1 is the value of trade. Similarly, when other countries give you good services and capital, you have to express everything in terms of money. Now, a record whereby you express this entire transaction in terms of money. So write the money value of this transaction and you also express this transaction in terms of money so whenever you buy whenever you sell something or buy something express it in terms of money and put it in a systematic manner in terms of a record this record is called as balance of payment right so see what is balance of payment so so balance of payment means monetary transaction between india and rest of the world so whenever you indulge in transaction with any other country so, so it has a mon monetary value, it has a money value. A systematic record of all that transaction in terms of money is called balance of payments. Now, I told you when we started the lecture, we had a discussion that what are the three things broadly, what are the three things that we normally buy and sell between two countries, goods, services and assets. I'll give you an example. So, for example, you know, suppose let's take two cases, India and USA. So, what do we sell to USA? Goods. For example, this bottle of water. When you sell something to a country, it's called export. So, in terms of goods, either we sell, when we sell, we get dollars, right? So, whenever we sell this water bottle to US, we get dollars and we become happy. Whenever we buy a bottle of water from USA, right? So, when USA sells this to us, we have to pay and making payments and giving money to somebody is not a happy thing, right? So, so look at this, this person, he is very sad, why? Because he is buying something, importing something, for, for that you have to pay money, right? So, so when you talk about goods, you either export goods and you earn dollars or you import goods and you pay dollars. When you earn money, you are happy. So when you don't earn money, you are not happy. Similarly, in terms of export of uh, services, so for example, you can give financial services or consultancy services to USA. When you give services, what do you get? You get dollars. And when you buy services, what do you do? You pay dollars, right? So whenever you export services, you are happy because you are earning money. But whenever you are buying services, you have to make a payment for that. And that's not a good thing, right? So, you are not very happy. So, when somebody will ask you a question that, you know, you are saying that you are exporting goods, you are happy. When you are importing goods, you are not happy. Then why are you importing? We are importing because no single country in the world can produce everything. We always depend on others for something or the other. We cannot produce everything, right? So, yes, this export and import will go. Now, Another question that could be asked is that for a country like India, what should be our objective? So the answer is our objective should be to export as much as possible, increase the export like this and to reduce import as much as possible. But you can never make your imports to be zero because one cannot produce everything on its own. So what countries do is, so whenever India and US indulge in trade, so, so I'm talking from India's perspective. India always wants to have a situation where we are able to export more and import less. Similarly, in terms of services also, our intention is to export more services and import less services. Because when we sell something, we get money. When we buy something, we have to pay money. And, and, and imagine a situation whereby we are selling less and we are buying more. It will become very unsustainable, very bad situation. So my income is 100 rupees, but I am buying, you know, goods and services worth 500 rupees. So that's unsustainable. So any country of this world would like to increase export and reduce import. Now, 
Let's come to this third part. This is called as asset. So for example, guys, have you heard that other countries invest money in India? Yes, you would have heard things like foreign portfolio investment, uh, foreign direct investment, all these things, right? So foreign portfolio investment is also called as hot money, which means somebody in US or somebody in any other country of the world, they invest in India for short term, right? Their only intention is to invest in India, make profit and return. That is called as foreign portfolio investment. What is foreign direct investment? Foreign direct investment means that a foreigner invests in India with a view for long term association with India, right? The association is not short term or transitory, but the association is long term whereby their interest means the interest of the investor and in interest of the domestic economy is aligned. If we grow, they also feel happy because they have come to India for a long term association. So foreign direct investment comes to India for long term association. Hence, they, they, they are invested in India from a long term perspective. So, so you see in India, you get foreign portfolio investment, foreign direct investment and, and in through many other ways, we get different forms of capital and assets in India. Now, <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. Whenever, listen to this question very carefully. Whenever, suppose we are selling something to a country, we will get dollars. But suppose there is a situation where we are selling less and we are buying more. Now, when you sell just one bottle of water, you are going to get one dollar. But you very well know that India imports a lot of things. I'll give you an example. India imports a lot of petrol products, petroleum, crude petroleum oil. India imports gold. India imports so many things. So when we import, we have to pay money. So suppose our export is $1, but our import is $100. So you are paying $100, but you are getting only $1 as income. Where are you, where are you? getting this 99 extra dollars from who is giving you these 99 dollars see one dollar which you earned that i understand but you are paying 100 dollars where did you get that extra 99 dollars somebody must have given you that so see your your earning is 100 but your expenditure is uh, your earning is one your expenditure is 100 so this 99 extra dollars where are you getting it from maybe this side foreign portfolio investment, foreign direct investment, which is coming to India, maybe from here money is coming and we are using it. But do you think it's a good idea that if India is getting foreign portfolio investment and foreign direct investment, should we use this money to finance our expenditure on day to day basis? Is it a good idea? Is it sustainable? So, so of course not. It can't continue for a very long time and it should not happen. Now, if it keeps on happening, and, 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 and then a situation comes when foreigners are not giving us foreign portfolio investment and foreign direct investment because of some reason. Let's say some crisis happens in the world and foreigners are not giving us this money. Now our expenditure is very high, $100 because we are importing a lot. Suppose we are importing so much that we need $100. Where are we going to get our $100 from if foreigners don't give us that? This is called crisis situation. And if an economy depends too much on the foreign capital like this to finance its expenditure, the situation might turn out to be very dangerous, right? So, so just keep these small things in mind. Now, whenever we talk about export of goods and export of services plus import of goods and import of services, if you take these two things together, it is called as current account. What is current account? In the current account, what we do is, we take exports of goods and export of services, and we take import of goods and import of services, and we call it as current account. So these two things taken together are called as current account. This side, where assets are involved, like foreign portfolio investment, foreign direct investment, it is called as capital account. And I told you that whenever there is a problem in this side, which means whenever there is a problem in the current account, who helps to, to rescue you or, or bail you out 
capital account. So when you take current account and capital account together, it is called as balance of payments. So what is balance of payment? Balance of payment gives you a detail of what is happening in the current account, which means this side and this side in terms of money. That is called as balance of payments. So if somebody will ask you what is balance of payment, you should say current account and capital account taken together. Right? Now let us look at it in, in, in slightly technical manner. See, now <clears throat> this is how balance of payment looks like. So, so I'm going to describe each component of the balance of, of payment for you uh, very briefly so that you have an idea about what we are going to learn in the economic survey. So what economic survey has done is economic survey is going to give you details of each of these components without giving you this structure. In economic survey, they don't give you this structure. They directly start to give you the details, data, you know, trend, etc, etc. A lot of tables, flowcharts they will give you, but they will not give you this structure. So, so before we get into economic survey, it's very important that we understand what is balance of payment in terms of its technicalities also. So you see, this is balance of payments. Balance of payments, as I told you, can be divided into two parts, current account, capital account. Now, <clears throat> current account can be divided into two parts. We have already seen. First is called visible or merchandise. Second is called as invisible or non-merchandise. So guys, what is visible and what is merchandise? So visible or mer merchandise means goods, trade in goods. What is the meaning of invisible or non-merchandise? It means trade in services. So invisible would mean services, visible or merchandise would mean goods. And we have already discussed that whenever we talk about goods, what are the two things that we see? Export and import, right? So whenever you talk about visible or merchandise, we look at their export, we look at their imports. What are the two categories in which we divide exports of India? We look at something called as petroleum, oil and lubricant. And we also look at something called as non-petroleum, oil and lubricant. We divide the things that we export into two types. Petroleum related products are called as POL, petroleum, oil and lubricant. Rest everything is called as non-POL. So if we are exporting this bottle of water, it is called as non-POL. And if I'm putting petrol inside it, that's POL, right? So there are two types of export related items that we see in India. Now when we talk about imports guys, focus here please. When you talk about imports, uh, so please focus on this side. When you talk about imports, there are three types of imports that we observe in India. See for India, it is like this. For other countries, it could be slightly different also. So for India, what are the things that we import? We import crude petroleum, isn't it? So petroleum or petroleum related products are called as POL. So we import crude petroleum and what do we export? We export refined petroleum and petroleum related products. So crude petroleum we import. So this is POL, imported item. Similarly, we import a lot of gold and silver, right? So first petroleum related products, then gold and silver. What is the third type of imports? So, so what we do is we call it as non-POL because we have already written POL. So non-POL, non-gold, silver, which means from our total import, from whatever we buy, remove petrol and remove gold and silver, whatever is left is called as non-POL, non-gold and silver. For example, if we import a mobile phone from other country, like if you are importing mobile phone from China, it will come under this category, non-POL, non-gold and silver. So this is your export and import. Now, <clears throat> what is balance of trade? Balance of trade means export minus import. So export this side and import this side. When you write export minus import, it is called as balance of trade. And I told you that when is trade in our favor, when export is more and import is less. Whenever you sell more, the trade is in your favor. So when are we going to say that balance of trade is positive for India? Whenever our exports are more than imports. So whenever our exports are greater than import, we would say, balance of trade is favorable to India. 
Now guys, just like we have seen that we have export of goods and import of goods. Similarly, we will also look at export and import of services, export and import of transfers and export and import of income. So see, when you talk about visible, you divided visible or merchandise only in one segment called as goods. So this is export of goods, this is import of goods. But invisibles can be divided into three categories. Invisible or non-merchandise can be divided into three categories. Services, transfer and income. What do you mean by services? So for example, India can sell telecom services, educational services, financial services to other countries. Similarly, India can buy these services also. So whenever we buy and sell these services, it comes under this category called as invisible. See this one. So what does India ideally want? Does India ideally want to buy services or sell more services? Sell more services, which means we want to export more services. Similarly, you have this category called as transfers, gift, donation, remittance. So when Indians go to other countries, right, what do we receive? Remittance. And let me tell you, India is one country which receives the highest amount of remittance since so many years. So, so I think since around 2008, the money that we are getting in the form of remittance is the highest in the world. What is remittance? When Indians go outside to work, they send money to India. That is remittance. Transfer of their wages, salaries and income to India. So, so similarly, other countries of the world give us gifts and donations. We also give gifts and donations to other countries. All those things are called as transfers. They are also a part of invisible. So UPSC has asked this question so many times that which of the following is called as invisible? Answer is services, transfers, right? And, and there is a third category which is also called as invisible. It is income. So income through investment, you know, and what kind of investment income? Interest, profit and rent. I'll give you an example. So guys, suppose, huh? so, so this is just to understand basic things. So suppose I have a flat, I put it on rent. What will I get? Rent income. I invest somewhere in a company. So what will I get? I'll get profits, right? So there are different ways in which you earn income when you invest. So there are some people in the world who invest in India and earn income. Similarly, Indians invest in other countries and earn income. If we as Indians go to other countries, invest and earn more income, it makes us stronger. But if other countries of the world are coming to India and they are investing in India and they are earning more income, that's not a great thing. Why? Because we have to give them income constantly, right? So what should we do? We should, we should try to get into a situation where Indians are earning more income from other countries, right? So, <clears throat> so just like you call this as balance of trade, what is balance of trade? Export of goods minus import of goods. So in, in visible or, or merchandise, we only take goods. And in invisible or non-merchandise, what are the things that we take? Services, transfer and income, right? So. What do you mean by balance of invisible? Just like balance of trade means export of goods minus import of goods. Balance of invisible means export of export of services, transfer and income minus import of services, transfer and income. So when we get more, it is a positive thing. When we have to give more, it's not a positive thing. So when are we going to say that balance of invisible BOI is in India's favor? We will say that balance of invisible is in India's favor when we get more income and we have to pay less income. Then we will say balance of invisible is in India's favor. When are we going to say that balance of trade is in our favor? When we are going to earn more income and through export and when we are going to pay less through import. Right? So, so see, what have we done? We have so far understood what is the meaning of current account. Current account has two parts, visible and invisible. This part is called as balance of trade. This is called as balance of invisible. Now, if you, if you take both balance of trade plus balance of invisible, it is called as
current account balance so what is the balance in current account it depends upon what is the balance in merchandise and what is the balance in invisible so whatever is the balance in trade plus the balance of invisible these two things taken together is called as current account balance right now in india it has been typically observed and this is what economic survey says economic survey says that ideally our balance of current account should be very good it should be positive which means we should sell more and buy less this is what should happen but because of something we are not able to do that and what is that thing balance of trade balance of trade is negative for india which means we buy more goods we sell less goods when you buy more you pay more right you give money from your pocket so this balance of trade turns negative less than zero it turns so negative that entire current account balance starts to come down this is worrisome for india that is what they have written in the economic survey so see guys if you do not go you with this method of of understanding the statement that balance of of trade is dangerous for india these days if this statement is given you need to go back and understand this entire thing only then you will understand why government is saying balance of trade is dangerous because these things are decently okay for india this is not right so when this is not okay if you mix these two the result can be dangerous your current account might look very bad right now now let's come to the other part it is called as capital account what is capital account as i told you that whatever you do as a country you should get more money you should get more dollars so see capital account has so many things inside it 1 2 3 4 5 these are the components of capital account so what is the first component of capital account foreign investment so so how do you get foreign investment guys through foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment foreign direct investment is a long term investment that comes to india and foreign portfolio investment is a short term investment that comes to india the second component of capital account is loans so so for example we borrow money from other countries right other countries also borrow money from us so those things are a part of capital account your loans borrowings lending they are a form of capital account now banking capital i'll give you an example so so let's talk about state bank of india hdfc bank what do you see in these banks even these banks hold foreign currency assets for example hdfc bank sbi these banks also have dollars these banks also have euro as currency they hold it because it is a currency asset which they can sell at any point of time right so these things are called as banking capital similarly nris also deposit their money in different accounts in india that is also called as banking capital so so what do you mean by banking capital foreign assets or liability of bank i gave you an example that banks of india hold uh, you know foreign currency like dollar euro etc they are called as banking capital and nri deposits are also a part of banking capital now rupee debt service i'll give you an example suppose that india has taken a lot of loan when you take loan after some time you have to repay the loan plus you have to pay interest rate also so when you have to repay the 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 loan amount plus interest rate it is called as debt service which means debt means borrowing you borrowed money now you have to service it means return it this is called debt service so whenever we take loans and we make the repayment of the loan plus interest in terms of rupee that is called as rupee debt service so rupee debt service is also a part of capital account now other capital what is other capital i'll give you another example so for example guys suppose that i am an indian businessman i am selling this water bottle in in let's say france fine when i sell this in france somebody is buying it that person should have paid the money right now when he is buying the bottle but suppose that person requests me that sorry i can't give you money because i don't have it i will make the payment after one month delayed payment for export so after one month when i get the payment i will write that amount under a column called as other capital see delayed export receipts 
Now, <clears throat> there is one more category which is called as subscribed capital. I'll, I'll explain what is subscribed capital. Have you heard that India is a member of World Bank Group? India is a member of IMF. India is a member of Asian Development Bank, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, New Development Bank. India is a member of many global institutions. When you become a member of global institution, you contribute something called as participating fee or the fees of the institution, right? You pay some fee, you become a member. The fee that you pay is called as subscribed capital. See, subscribed capital. So, for example, suppose India becomes a member of IMF. India is already a member of IMF. So, when suppose India became the member of IMF, India paid, let's say, $1 million to IMF to become the member. That $1 million which India paid to IMF to become the member is called as India's subscribed capital or India's subscription to IMF. Now, that money that we give to global institutions to become their member, that capital is written in balance of payment under this column called as other capital. Similarly, guys, you would have also heard that Reserve Bank of India from time to time they buy a lot of gold, right? And they put it in the reserve. So when Reserve Bank of India buys gold, there is a money value of the gold. That money value is mentioned here in this column called as other capital. So what do you mean by capital account? In capital account, you find foreign investment, which is FDI and FPI. You have loans, you have banking capital, you have rupee debt service, and you have other capital. Any of these could be asked in UPSC. And, and let me tell you this, that UPSC has some kind of fascination and some kind of, of love with this uh, you know, diagram and this flowchart, they ask so many questions just from this flowchart. All right, so you must memorize it before your exam. Now, do you know what, you, what, what economic survey has done? What economic survey has done in the chapter is, they haven't given you this flowchart, but they have picked each of these points and they have written paragraphs on it, that this is how, the export of petroleum related product happened, import of petroleum related product happened. So they have given the details of everything in literature form. What I have done is, so, so we have just discussed the structure. Now in this structure only, let us put some numbers and some arrows which will allow us to understand whether the export of petroleum related product has gone up or down, whether the export and import of gold and silver has gone up or down. So let us understand each of these things in detail. But we are going to, to start the discussion with merchandise, which means export and import of goods. So first we will focus on export and import of goods. Then we would understand balance of trade. Then we would have a look at invisible. And then here we are going to learn about services, transfer and income. Then we will look at balance of invisible. Then we are going to mix balance of trade and invisible so that we understand what is current account balance. Then we will come to this side. We will understand these. And then this side will be called as, you know, bal uh, balance of capital account, right? So we will study capital account and then we will mix this entire thing. It will be called as BOP. This is how we are going to study this topic. So now let us have a look at the export and import of goods in the current account, right? So in the balance of payment, as we are discussing, the most important thing that a country wants is to have a very healthy and a very strong export side, right? Because nobody wants to, wants to in, you know, spend money. Everybody wants to earn money. And how do you earn money? By exporting more. So, so let us have a clear understanding of what is the level of export and import uh, as far as visible. Visible means goods are concerned. So basically we are going to look at the export of goods and import of goods. So see guys, as I told you that in India, we divide our export commodities or goods into two categories. First is POL, petrol, uh, petroleum, oil and lubricant. And second is non-POL, non-petroleum oil and lubricant. So when you talk about the POL, in 2020, in our entire export, the share of POL was 9%. See, what was the contribution of petroleum oil and lubricant in our export? 9% in 2020. In 2021, it became 15%, which means, yes, there was a recovery after COVID. 
in terms of non pol which means it is not related to petroleum so what are the things that we export engineering goods jewelry chemicals and all these things right so so what is the contribution of non pol in our export so contribution of pol is 15% rest of of our you know export comprises of non pol so the contribution of non pol in our export is more than pol right it's only 15% rest 85% comes from non pol which are some of the major exported items in non pol category as we discussed engineering goods jewelry and chemicals now why why do we see that the share of non pol has increased after covid because government of india has taken some steps even though small steps but very important steps like government of india has reduced import duties on raw material plus ease of doing business so for example guys if indian jewelers are manufacturing polished jewelry very high value jewelry or or indians are you know creating engineering goods complicated engineering goods so we need raw material to do all these things right the raw material is not available in india we import these things for example we import gold we convert gold into jewelry so what did the government of india do government of india has reduced import duties on the raw material so that our manufacturers would find it you know easy and and would find it less costly to import raw material so that they can create high value products so so this is what we have written here government has taken a lot of steps to promote this non pol category so you see in terms of export upsc might ask you a question that who is the biggest contributor of exports in india answer is non pol pol its contribution is 15% and the contribution of non pol is 85% now agriculture is very important so i thought i'll i'll, I'll discuss agriculture a little bit here because agriculture is not related to petroleum right it's related to non petroleum oil and lubricants so so in terms of agriculture has government of india taken any concrete steps to promote export of agricultural products yes so you see government of india has issued online certificate to increase export so if i want to export agricultural commodities you see it was a covid time so government of india said you don't need to come to office to get a stamp done you know for attestation etc etc you just need to file one online document and you can export agricultural products out of india so it's a very good step it saves a lot of time and cost second is krishi udan 2020 you see udan is a very ambitious scheme of government of india where government is trying to promote low cost airlines across india in the tier 2 and tier 3 cities of india government of india is promoting the low cost airline one of the one of the components of of that scheme of government of india where they are trying to promote you know low cost airline is government is trying to use that scheme so that we can transfer our agricultural products to other countries also which means export of agricultural products and for that the government of india has started dedicated flight services using which we can export our agricultural products to other countries so it is under krishi udan so so what do we observe since last 2 3 years we observed that government of india has been promoting Uh, of course with the active participation of the agricultural community and the farmers the government of india is promoting the export of marine products means fisheries buffalo meat tea coffee dairy products etc so these things are being exported more out of india compared to 2020 what does it tell you so so it it gives a message that earlier we were exporting only limited set of products related to agriculture rice wheat cereals etc now we are also exporting dairy products more of buffalo meat you know more of marine products tea coffee which means we are diversifying our agricultural basket which we are exporting to other countries so this diversification is is a very positive outcome during covid that because of covid it's it's not that we are not exporting something in fact despite covid we have been able to diversify our agricultural export commodities let me give you an example look at this data so upsc you know might ask you a question that which of the following items 
belong to top 10 agricultural exports of India. So these are those 10 items which are exported the most out of India in terms of agriculture. So marine product, rice, spices, sugar, buffalo meat, then again rice, basmati, cotton, then wheat, castor oil and miscellaneous processed items. So these are the things that we export. You have to memorize this. list. You don't have to memorize this data, but you have to memorize this list just in case UPSC asks you a question. Now the total agricultural export of India, has it gone up, has it gone down, right? So see, in the year 2019-20, if you look at the total agricultural exports, 35.6, right? So we are talking in billion dollars, so 35.6 billion dollars. Now in 2020-21, it became 41.9, which means despite COVID, our agricultural export increased. So it's a good thing. Now we have to compare it with 2021-22. So what did government of India do? In the year 2020 and 21, government of India took the data for April to November. In the year 21-22, which means last year, the government has taken data from April to November and they are comparing. So they are comparing 2020 with 2021, but only April to November. So see, if you see that April to November 2020, we were exporting 25.2 billion dollars worth of agricultural items and now in, in the year 2021, we exported 31 billion dollars worth of agricultural commodities. So yes, our export increased, but if you compare our exports in 2020, then you compare it with 2021, it has come down. If you compare the pre-COVID level of export with post COVID, the latest figure, it's less, which means the recovery by agriculture after COVID has not happened to the extent of 100% in terms of exports. You see 35.6, 31. Of course, we are taking the data till November. If you take, if you take the data for more months, things could have been different, but that data is not there. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm just comparing these two. Ideally, we should not because it is only for April to November. But just to get an idea, so 35.6 and 31, if I, if I do a, a very basic layman kind of comparison, maybe, just maybe, agriculture hasn't recovered fully, right? And if you compare 2021, then the difference looks very stark, very huge difference, 41 and 31. Even if we would have taken more months, this 31 could become 34, right? But still 41 is very high, which means recovery is, is there. Compared to last year, it, the recovery is there. But compared to pre-COVID time and 2020, this export looks little low, fine? These are the things that you have to extract from the economic survey. Economic survey won't directly tell you these things. They would very smartly give you this table and they'll leave you, right? You keep wondering that, oh, from 25.2 it became 31. Yes, it has. But I also need to compare this 31 with this and this, right? So, so this was about agriculture. Now let's, let's look at the import. As I was telling you that both export and import are important. So in terms of imports, we are going to look at POL, right? And I gave you the basic idea. First thing POL, second is gold and silver and third type of import is non-POL, non-gold and silver. So there are three types of imports under balance of payment, right? So <clears throat> what, is the, what is the trend in POL, petroleum, uh, you know, oil and lubricant related import? We import a lot of crude oil, right? Raw, raw oil. So, so currently the POL import contributes 27% in our import. So in our total import, 27% just belongs to POL. And it is increasing, right? So our imports are increasing. What is the share of gold and silver in our total import? The share of gold and silver is 9%. See, this is your gold and silver. So the share of petroleum related products is 27, crude petroleum, share of gold is 9%. And its share is increasing. See, gold import is increasing very sharply. And, and the share of non-POL and non-gold and silver, its share is also increasing and its contribution is close to 64%, total 100%. So out of our import, what is the contribution of POL, petroleum related products, 27%, gold and silver, 9%, non-petroleum, non-gold, 64%. 
So, so this is the biggest contributor in our import. Now, in this category called as non-POL, non-gold and silver, which are the most important imported items. So, so what do we import? See, major contribution is by electronic goods, pearl, precious stones, coal, etc. These are our major imported items. Now, I told you that any country of this world would like to, to have a situation where we sell more and buy less, right? where we export more, import less. So, there is a formula called balance of trade or merchandise trade balance. It says balance of trade is equal to export of goods minus import of goods. And you know our export should be high, import should be low. But in India, it's the opposite. Opposite has happened. What has happened? Our exports are low and our imports have become very high, which means our balance of, of trade or in this equation, it becomes negative. Why? Because this figure is low, see, low, very small and this is very high. So it becomes negative, right? So this is how you have to interpret and understand the current account. In current account, what did we do? We have so far done visible or merchandise, which means export and import of goods. Now, guys, we are going to look into the export and import of non-merchandise, which means services, transfer and income. Three things, right? So, before we do that, we can have a quick look at some of the items that we are exporting and some of the items that we are importing. It will give us a good idea about what is happening in the economy. So see, these are some of the easy things, but UPSC, you know, sometimes they end up asking these questions in the exam as well. So let's look at some data related to export, which are the top 10 items that are exported out of India. So see, you have to remember this. For UPSC, you have to remember. And for various competitive exams, you must know this. So for example, petroleum product, pearl, precious, semi-precious stone, iron, steel, drug, etc. So these are the top 10 exports of India. You have to take a note of this. Now, which are the top 10 export destinations of India? Which means which are the countries where we export the most? So, so our top export destination is USA followed by UAE, China, Bangladesh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Netherlands, UK. In place of Belgium, it was Malaysia last year. So Belgium has become our one of the top export destinations by replacing Malaysia. So here, earlier, there was this country called Malaysia where we used to export a lot. Now Belgium has taken its place, which means trade relation with Belgium has been very favorable to us because we are able to sell a lot to them. Which country tops the list as far as our export is concerned? USA. So you know, these seven countries, USA till Netherlands, these seven countries contribute 40% to our export. So if India is exporting 100 boxes, 40 boxes are being exported to these countries. Does it look like a diversified trade or, or looks like a concentrated trade? See, over the period of time, we can say that our export partners have become diversified. We are not just dependent on two countries or three countries. Now we are exporting to, you know, 40% of our export is going to seven countries. So yes, we are exporting to a diversified set of countries. But even then, you know, we can see that there is a scope of improvement. Why to depend on just these seven countries? We could look for more markets, right? We could export to more number of countries. So <clears throat> we should not depend only on a few friends where we can sell goods. We should also sell our goods to many more countries. So yes, there is a scope of improvement. Fine, this is how you should interpret this. Now, what are the top 10 items that India imports? You must memorize this for UPSC. They can ask you this question anytime and nobody wants to go wrong in these kind of factual questions. So, so if you read it twice or thrice, this list, it will, it will get internalized in your mind. It's not very difficult. So, so these are the top 10 items that we import. Now, if you look at the source of import, which means which are those countries from which we import a lot. You see China is number one, then UAE, no wonders, then UAE, USA, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, etc. Now this Switzerland has made a comeback. Last year it was not in this list. This year it has made a comeback. 
If you look at China, Chinese contribution in our import. So we import a lot of things. We buy a lot of things from China. So Chinese contribution was 18% in 2020. So 2021, it became 16%. So yes, our dependence on China reduced just a little bit. But even then, we depend a lot on China for our imports. So trade is not in our favor when it comes to China, right? Now, let's look at balance of trade in goods. As I was telling you that we are studying balance of payments in, in, in small segments so that we, we understand it in detail. See, what did we do? We have so far understood balance of payments in terms of visible. Visible means goods, export and import of goods. So now let us have a look at this merchandise trade balance. I gave you an idea that we are importing more, exporting less. But let's look at some details of it, right? So let us look at balance of trade. Balance of trade means trade in goods. So see, so if you look at India's trade balance, which means only export and import of goods, with which country we have a positive trade balance, which means to which country do we, to which country do we sell more? We sell more and buy less USA. With USA, we have a positive trade balance, which means with USA, we sell more and we buy less. So similarly, we have positive trade balance with USA, Bangladesh, Nepal, Turkey, Netherlands, UK, Italy. So to these countries, one to seven, we sell more and we buy less. So we have a positive trade balance. So we can say positive trade balance. And to all these other countries, you see it's negative, which means starting from number eight, Korea till China, we buy more, we sell less, hence negative trade balance. And if you look carefully at, at this chart, see, this shows increasing merchandise trade balance due to high growth in export and import. So what is trade balance? I told you that balance of trade, guys, balance of trade is equal to export minus import of goods. Any country would like to have more export. Yes, but let's see what has happened off late. Look at 2020, 21. So 2021 and 2022 in this side. Look at this side. Look at this. This one is import. Our import is high. And look at our export. Our export is low. When your import is high, export is low, your trade balance is negative. This is zero line. See, this is zero line. So your trade balance is negative. This is your trade balance. It's negative. Similarly, here also your ex import is high, export is less, trade balance. Here also your import is high, export is less, so trade balance. So trade balance is becoming more and more negative with time, which means with time, India is importing more and more and India is exporting less. So we are exporting less compared to import, which means compared to, to export, our imports are very, very high because of which our balance of trade is negative. It's not in our favor. Do you think it's a good thing? No. So if I keep on buying, buying and buying, importing, importing and importing, and I don't export that much, one day it is going to trouble me. That is something which is very scared, which is, which is very scary for the policymakers. And our policymakers are scared only because of this thing, right? So even when our export was increasing, see, our export increased here. But our imports increase faster than export. That's the bad thing. We are not able to export more, right? Okay, so now we are going to get into balance of invisible. So, so what is balance of invisible in this diagram? See, in this diagram, which I taught you, balance of payments. I have taught you current account. In current account, I taught you visible. Now we are going to understand what is invisible. We will study invisibles. So we have seen that invisible balance of trade, it's very negative in India, right? Now we are going to look at invisible and see what is its status. Then we will combine these two and then we will see what is the status of current account. All right. So now let us have a look at 
the balance of invisibles and if you recall uh, what does invisible comprise of invisible comprises of services transfer and income so you see this is our chart right so balance of payment current account capital account in current account we have already seen what is the status and what is the trend of visible visible means goods export and import of goods and we have seen that balance of trade which means export and import of goods is largely negative in india largely negative and this is something about which even our policy makers are worried and it is mentioned in the economic survey right now let us look into what is the status of invisibles invisible would mean as we said services transfer and income so in terms of services guys what has been the growth in export of services see india is very famous for services our economy depends upon services what has happened during covid so the export of services increased by 18.4% right so so this is higher than pre covid level so we have already surpassed the pre covid level of increase in export of services which is a good thing and which are the services which india exports the most this can be asked in upsc so computer services business and transportation so these are the services which we provide to the world and in which we we dominate so 80% of our export in services comprise of these three computer business and transport now when it comes to import we also buy services right so so the growth in import of services have been phenomenal more than 20% 21.5% has been the growth in import of services now this is higher than the pre covid level and which are the services which we we import the most so business transport travel and computer services these are the services which we import the most so approximately 75% of our import of services belongs to these right so so a majority of the import of services almost 75% of our import of services comprise of these business transport travel and computer services now when it comes to comes to transfer you see india is one country which is right at top in terms of remittances so so for example when somebody from india goes to middle east or 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 goes to to other countries of the world canada usa uk they send income in india right they transfer income to india that is called as remittance so the remittance that we get inward remittance means the remittance that we get is is the highest in the world since 2008 india is at number 1 rank first in terms of receiving remittances from other countries right so in 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 that sense transfers has been very good let's talk about income you remember guys when we started this this lecture today so we discussed this small point that when you invest in some other countries right what do you get you get interest you get rent you get profit when people from other countries invest in india they also get interest profit rent so so when it comes to income it will be said that indians are at advantage if we get more interest we get more rent we get more profit but it's the opposite actually we pay more interest we pay more rent and we give away more profit that is what is mentioned so so in terms of the net overseas investment income we pay more right we give away more we get less so so when when you combine services transfer and income all the three together it is called as balance of invisibles right so when would you say that balance of invisible is in our favor when we get more and we pay less right when do you say that balance of trade is in our favor when we export more import less this is worrisome so even if balance of invisible is decent for india even if this is good for india but this balance of trade is so negative that balance of trade pulls down this entire thing because when you mix balance of trade and balance of invisible together they are called as current account balance you see balance of trade plus balance of invisible your balance of invisible might be decent or healthy but if your balance of trade is very negative this entire current account balance turns out to be negative so let's see see in the year 2019 20 this is pre covid right this is called as pre covid and this is called as covid and this is called as post covid so pre covid 
our current account balance. What is current account balance? Balance of trade plus balance of invisible. This was hugely negative. Hence, our current account balance was negative. See, 2019-20 negative. This is current account balance. So we are taking current account balance on the y-axis. So our current account balance was negative. 2020-21, it turned out to be positive. Why? Because our exports increased and because of lockdown restriction, etc., our imports reduced. So this time, plus we did well here as well. So our current account balance, it went up. What has happened now in, in the post-COVID world 2021? Initially, our current account balance was turning out to be good positive but then because balance of trade turned out to be hugely negative because we are importing a lot hence this graph came down two things made our balance of of uh, you know our current account balance to be negative number one in you know balance of trade our import is very very high Hence, our current account balance started to come down because imports are very high. And in balance of invisible, guys, here in the balance of invisible, this income that you see, which means the income that we give away to foreigners is very, very high. So because of that, this also reduced. You see these two points. So import of goods and the income that we give away, these two have pulled our current account balance uh, in the negative zone right in the post covid world so this entire thing can be asked in upsc in the form of literature and sentences right so so you should revise this graph you should practice it before your prelims right so this is how the current account balance looks like see how how wavy it is it is going up and down right so we call it as swing swing pattern so now we are going to get into capital account right if you remember I told you that balance of payment consists of two accounts, current account and capital account. Remember capital account where we talked about foreign portfolio investment, foreign direct investment. So we are going to look into capital accounts in detail. See, this is your balance of payments. Balance of payment has current account and capital account. We have already studied current account, visible merchant, you know, visible or merchandise. We have seen the trend of export, import and balance of trade. We have seen that exports are of two types, POL and non-POL. We have seen imports. Imports are of three types, POL, then gold and silver. And third is non-POL, non-gold, non-silver, right? So these are the th things that we saw here. In, in invisibles, we saw services, transfer and income. We saw that import has been very high in India. So balance of trade is very negative. We also saw income is the culprit because of which balance of invisible is also reducing. So we saw that these two taken together, our current account balance became negative because of these two culprits, right? This is how the graph helps us to understand what is going on, isn't it? So if these two are not very good, of course, your current account will not be very healthy. It will be unhealthy. That's, that is what we saw. Now, we are getting into capital account. What are the components of capital account? Foreign investment. What is the what are the components of foreign investment foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment these two are the components of foreign investment then we have loans so so when we borrow from other countries it is called as loans when others borrow from us it is called as lending so sometimes we borrow sometimes we lend so these are called as loans i already explained what is banking capital to you so for example the commercial banks they keep dollars and other currencies nri deposit all these things are called banking capital rupee debt service and other capital these are the components of capital account in india so if you look at the balance sheet of rbi you know rbi would talk about these things in great detail rbi discusses these things in its reports when they when they mention about the balance of payment etc economic survey also discusses these things in great detail not the concept part but the data related to these things are greatly discussed in economic survey but you cannot understand these things if you don't understand the concept so do revise the concepts before you get into data and the table and the graphs all right so we are going to see what is the status of these five so see so so we are going to analyze the foreign investment foreign portfolio investment first so first we'll analyze 
this foreign portfolio then foreign direct investment what did i tell you about foreign portfolio investment that they they have short term interest in a country they don't come to a country for long term they come they make profit and they quickly leave right so so let's see what foreign portfolio investment has been doing in india so you see this is debt and this is equity debt would mean that somebody from a foreign country like usa comes to india and invest in bonds right so when that person invest in bond that means they have to keep their money in india for a certain period of time so if you buy a bond the time period of the bond is fixed one year two years three years right so so one type of investment in which the foreigners indulge in investment in debt which means bonds another investment is equity which means foreigners come to india they buy shares for example recently the share of paytm was sold right paytm zomato uh, nika all these things so when foreigners buy these shares it is called as investment in equity now see so your total foreign portfolio investment is investment in debt and investment in equity taken together and i told you that what is what is the interest of foreigners they want to come to india and quickly leave so which investment would they prefer to have mostly equity because they come to india they buy shares then they sell shares they make profit and they leave right so this is their most favorite thing let's see what has happened now in the year 2019 20 we can clearly see that the foreign portfolio investors are investing a lot in equity they also invested in debt and then then we see something interesting then we see that the investment in equity suddenly jumping jumping up right lot of ipos were released right and foreigners invested a lot of money which means fpi increased in india then it started to come down and now finally it has come down you see here now <clears throat> why is this happening why is the foreign portfolio investment so so it went up and then why is it coming down basically few things number 1 so i told you that one of the intentions of foreign portfolio investment is come to a country like india make profit and leave so guys imagine if you are a us citizen if you have 100 dollars in your hand if you find that the rate of interest in india is good you will bring your money here but if you find that the rate of interest in usa is good you will take back your money so the interest rate in usa has been increasing of late and there has been a signal from us fed that interest rate is going to be increased more hence the foreign portfolio investor would go away from india that is what they are doing the us monetary policy right second inflation india has undergone a period of inflation inflation makes the economy unstable whenever there is instability in the economy things are not very very organized and stable foreign investors wait and they don't go to such a country and if they have gone they go back nobody likes to indulge in an economy whereby the macroeconomic indicators like inflation are bad when the inflation is high there is certain sense of instability unpredictability and you know that the impact of inflation is that it eats away your currency it eats away your wealth so if i have 100 rupees in my hand inflation is 10% the real value of 100 rupee comes down so foreign investors don't prefer to stay too long if the inflation is high they don't like instability hence you see foreign portfolio investment has been coming down now <clears throat> there is one thing which upsc might ask you that what is the inclination of foreign portfolio investors in india it's mostly equity right and and if you look at the recovery in the in the post covid period see this is your covid period foreign portfolio investment is high in the post covid period recovery hasn't happened so you must note this point for upsc now there is a scheme called as voluntary retention scheme voluntary retention root scheme the government of india started this because we want the foreign portfolio investors to stay in india for some time i told you what is their habit they bring dollars to india they make profit and they leave why do they leave easily because mostly they invest in equity which means shares they buy shares they sell shares and they leave now government of india is trying to motivate them to buy more bonds and when they buy bonds government is telling them that if you buy a bond worth 3 years so if you put your money in india for 3 years we will give you a lot of concessions for you rules and regulations would be simple we would not trouble you and torture you 
So see what government of India has been doing. Government of India has launched a scheme called as voluntary retention route. What is the scheme? So suppose somebody from US has dollars and, and they want to bring foreign portfolio investment in India. Foreign portfolio investment is also called as hot money. Now it comes to India. So government of India told them that if you bring your dollar through FPI, foreign portfolio investment, and if you buy bonds in India, so government of India is going to give concession in rules and regulations. So when they buy bonds in India, government of India says, we will give you concession in rules and regulations. We will not put too many restrictions, right? Uh, which means very fastly you can come, you can do your paperwork very fastly. We will not put a lot of restrictions and formalities. Things will be smooth for you. But in return, we need a promise that whatever money you bring in India, for example, suppose this, this, this person from USA brings $100 in India and he invests money in Indian bonds. So government of India says, we will give you concession only if you promise that you are going to retain 75% of your investment, which means if you bring $100, you have to retain $75 in India for at least three years, which means government of India is making such a policy that we are showing our good side to the foreigners that, hey, we will give you concession. But then what is our intention? We want the foreigners to put their money at least for three years in India. So we are saying, Whatever money you bring, 75% of that money must stay in India for three years, then we will give you concessions. And why are we doing this? Because we noticed that these, these foreign portfolio investors have a lot of interest and inclination only in equity. We want them to have interest in debt also, because if they invest in debt, that money stays in India for long, right? So this is one. Now let's come to foreign direct investment. I told you what is the meaning of foreign direct investment? Meaning of foreign direct investment is when some foreigners invest in India with long term perspective in mind. And those people who bring foreign direct investment in India, they also bring technology, good management practices, etc. in Indian companies. So, so see, in the year 2019-20, the foreign direct investment was somewhere in this range. See, so it's range bound, which means it's, it's almost stable then because of covid it came down then there was a rebound see in 2020 it was a very good year for india for both foreign portfolio investment and foreign direct investment very nice year but then it started to come down and then it started to come down again which means the recovery that we have made in the year 2021 here this recovery overall is not as good as things were there earlier Right. So in foreign direct investment also, the recovery has not that been great. And I, as I told you that one of the main reasons is volatility in, in the Indian economy because of inflation, because of US monetary policies, etc. Both foreign portfolio investment and foreign direct investment, they have started to withdraw and the pace has started to come down. So what did you observe? That yes, there has been increase in FDI and FPI during COVID. After COVID also, things looked okay, but then because of volatility, recently we saw that FDI and FPI, they are shying away from India. They were doing good. In 2020, they did very good. In 2021, they wanted to do good. But then in 2021, there was a slight hesitancy and they became a little conservative, right? Now, <clears throat> let, us look at, let us look at the balance of payments. And let us look at some of the important features in this balance of payment, which UPSC can ask you. So see, we have already done this. So, so now you would find it to be very easy. Balance of payment are divided into two parts, current account and capital account. In current account, we have already done two things. We have, we have seen that first one is called as merchandise. Merchandise means export and import of goods. And here, export and import of invisibles non-merchandise and what did we do in non-merchandise we took services we took transfer and we took income this one is called as balance of trade this one is called as balance of invisible so your current account balance is called as balance of trade and balance of invisible and i told you that one of the scary things about india currently is that in in this merchandise our imports are very high that's scary 
and in invisibles this income part is against us because foreigners are taking more income from us so that is also dangerous so if you look at the current account balance balance of trade and balance of invisible have moved in such a way that in 2019 20 we had a deficit which means we were not doing good we were buying more and we were selling less in 2020 21 there was a surplus which means india was selling more india was buying less it's a good thing now when you look at current account balance in 21 22 there was a deficit overall deficit which means we were buying more and we were selling less when you buy more it's not a good thing it's not a good thing and why were we buying more because we were mainly importing a lot we were importing i told you the two problems imports were very high here and this income part was against us so in 21 22 we we had deficit now i just taught you capital account in capital account what did we see see this was our capital account foreign investment fdi fpi loans rupee etc so see banking capital increased right rupee debt service increased other capital increased now our borrowings loans also increased everything increased so what has happened in our capital account you see in our capital account the net you see capital account balance means net inflow or outflow which means in the capital account we would mention that things are positive if we get more dollars we will say things are negative if we give away more dollars so in 2019 20 we had surplus which means we got more dollars and you just saw that foreign investment was very good in 2020 21 there was a surplus again in 2021 22 there, there was surplus again which means in this side overall we have surplus now the interesting thing is that in balance of payment what is balance of payment balance of payment is equal to current account plus capital account which means this plus this is equal to balance of payment now whenever there is a problem in this side you remember i told you that whenever we import more and if we fall short of money where do we get our money from this side so whenever foreigners give money to us we use that money to increase our import right so what we saw in india was that in 2019 20 there was deficit and in this side there was surplus so in the second half of 2019 20 the surplus on capital account was very very good because of which we could actually make up for this negative thing our current account deficit was bad but here the surplus was good in the second half of 2019 so this deficit was actually covered by taking money from here so we took money from here and we covered it in 2020 21 we had surplus here surplus here which means great scenario in 21 22 there was deficit here which means it was negative because we were importing more but this side we had so much of surplus that this surplus could actually make up for this negativity and overall we were doing very good so we did good in two phases one here and one here only because this side had huge surplus let me show you this through a graph look at this please so so in 2019 20 let me show you this so this this is capital account this is current account this is balance of payment so look at look at 2019 20 so this is 1920 20. i told you in 1920 20, if you remember so this capital account surplus was so good that it made up for this problem so see here our capital account was positive see high our current account was negative but as you come to the second half of 2019 20 you see our current account start our capital account was so good that it pulled our current account also so overall balance of payment was very positive here look at this positive part and here it is that part where both current account and capital account were positive see in 2020 this is surplus this is surplus 
So overall two surplus things, when you mix two surplus things, your balance of payment was up. When you come to this side, 2021, I told you that in 2021, our capital account had huge surplus. See, look at the number of arrows, huge surplus. But this was negative. But this was so positive, so positive that it covered this negative thing and everything became positive. So here, this, this, this part, capital account is so positive that it covered this negative thing and balance of payment became positive, right? So, so let me show you this. So what do you observe? We observe that we observe that because of capital account, our negativity of current account was covered in this phase. You see, capital account is positive. It has pulled the negativity. So we have surplus here. Similarly here, in balance of payment, it's, it's, it's positive because this capital account was so good that it pulled everything up, right? Now, if you come to this part, here also you will see that, you know, capital account is so good that it has pulled everything up. So whenever your capital account is very strong, it is able to pull the negative current account. That is the trend. So guys, if we get a lot of money using FDI, see here, if we, if we get a lot of money using FDI, FPI, etc., when uh, bank, loans, banking capital, if, if you are getting a lot of money through these two banking loan, etc., don't you think we will have a lot of foreign exchange reserves? Yes. So India's foreign exchange reserve has been increasing. Using that foreign exchange reserve, we can easily import whatever we want. So our current stock of foreign exchange reserve is so much that we can easily import for a few months without any stress. So that is called as import cover. See, you have this diagram where we have mentioned import cover. See, this is import cover. So, so what we are seeing is that since we are getting a lot of foreign capital. Our capital account is good, which means we are getting a lot of dollars. So our foreign exchange reserve is increasing. And who keeps foreign exchange reserve? Foreign reserve, RBI. So with RBI, they have currently this much of foreign exchange reserve. This is $634 billion of forex reserve. See, in 2019, we have $430 billion forex reserve. Now currently, we have $634 billion forex reserves. This is good enough for India to keep importing without any stress for 13 to 14 months. For 13 to 14 months, even if we don't earn anything, we have so much of dollar with RBI that at least for one year, we can import anything we want very comfortably. This is called import cover. Import cover means what is the extent to which you can import using your foreign exchange reserves, which is healthy as of now. All right. So now we are going to understand what is the movement in exchange rate, right? So, so before I, I show you the movement in exchange rate, can I give you some basic idea about exchange rate? See, so guys, this is rupee, this is dollar, right? So, so suppose normally 70 rupees is equal to one dollar, normally, fine. So if you give 70 rupees, you will get one dollar. Now what happens is, because of some reason, suppose India gets a lot of foreign investment, FPI, FDI, right? So what happens? Our dollar becomes huge. This is the dollar that we get. And, and, and then what happens? You have this rupee. So whenever the supply of dollar increases and the supply of rupee is less, supply of dollar is more. So whenever supply of something is more, its value comes down. Its value is down. And whenever rupee is less, its value goes up. So because of FDI, FPI, we get more dollars. So when something is supplied more, its value goes down and the value of rupee goes up. This is called as appreciation. Right? 
right and the opposite is that because of some reasons suppose that the circle of dollar becomes smaller and the circle of rupee relatively is almost similar but the circle of dollar becomes smaller see here your dollar was huge oversupply of dollars your rupee was less hence the value of rupee was more value of dollar was less appreciation but when the opposite happens when your dollar is smaller your rupee is relatively more then a situation might come whereby the value of your dollar goes up why because see here you had so much of dollar here you have less dollar when something is less its value increases right so value of dollar goes up and value of rupee goes down when value of rupee goes down we call it depreciation and what did i tell you that of late what is happening in india recently so so foreign portfolio investment fdi recently very recently they are going back to usa so when dollar goes back to usa what happens to the value of dollar when something is available in less amount its value goes up so the value of dollar is going up value of rupee is coming down so depreciation is happening of late so you see movement in exchange rate against dollars so we we have a list of emerging market economies and we are looking at the movement of the currency rupee vis-a-vis -vis dollar and we see it's negative which means our currency is slightly depreciating of late why because dollars are going away right so guys now we are going to examine a very important question it says how resilient is indian economy what is the meaning of resilience i'll i'll, I'll give you a real life example so see this is year 20 let's say 15 right and this is year 2022 now in the year 2015 see life is full of challenges for everybody so in the year 2015 you would have faced some challenge isn't it so when you faced some challenge in the year 2015 how did you react so suppose you reacted in a particular manner right i call it as reaction 1 now suppose this year you face a challenge again your reaction is this year is called as reaction 2 so if i have to find out whether you have become good in handling some kind of challenges then i will compare how you reacted to challenge in the year 2015 with how you reacted in the year 2022 and if i feel that the way you reacted this year is much more efficient much better you did not buckle down under stress then i would say that yes you have become resilient you have become strong so if you have to find out whether indian economy has become resilient or strong over a period of time let us go back in history and see how india reacted to some economic challenges 10 years back and let us now examine how india is reacting to the new challenge called covid today and we will compare these two right if we are reacting in a better manner we would say indian economy is slowly becoming more resilient right so how do we compare it so to understand what was our reaction in in the year 2013 which means in in back in history how did we react to challenges we would look at two things taper tantrum and fragile five these two phenomenon was observed in the indian economy uh, around year 2012 13 right so we are going to look at that now <clears throat> today also they are saying many economists and experts are saying that if something like taper tantrum happens to india today called as taper tantrum 2.0 so this is called as taper tantrum 1.0 and if taper tantrum happens today so experts are saying india is much more capable to handle it in a efficient manner let us examine if they are right or not all right so let's see so guys uh, let me show you two news items so so this news item is from january 29 2014 as you can see the date so this says india is one of the economy india is one of the economies in world's fragile five so there were many economies in fragile five there were five economies right india is one of them so this was the news item in the year 2014 which means that they are saying india was a very fragile very docile kind of economy now look at the news item in 2022 this is february 7 2022 few days back so so it says taper minus the tantrum indian economy more resilient today 
well placed to absorb US Fed tightening shock, which means we are more resilient and we can face any shock which is given to us in the nature of economic shock. These are the two news items. So let's compare what happened in 2013-14 and what is happening today. So guys, in, in my previous video, I have already taught you what is taper tantrum. Let me help you to revise it so that we can quickly, uh, you know, use taper tantrum phenomenon to answer this question, right? So, so let me let me briefly tell you what happened in taper tantrum. So there was this global financial crisis which happened in the year 2008 and 9. When global financial crisis happened, many banks of the world, many you know companies, they became bankrupt. They were shut down. People lost jobs, etc., etc. Right? These things happened. Now, how did US react to it? So let's go to USA. This is US Fed, Central Bank of USA. What did USA do? USA started a program called as quantitative easing. What happened in quantitative easing? The Federal Bank of USA, Federal Reserve of USA, it told its people that it will buy bonds from the market. So what did US Fed do? See, see, look at this guy. He has bond. So US Fed bought the bond. When US Fed would buy the bond, they would pump in dollar. So this guy would give bond to the Fed and Fed in return would give dollars. So, so what is this called as? This is called as liquidity injection in the economy, quantitative easing. So in this quantitative easing program, the US Fed was pumping dollars or pumping money in the economy. When a lot of dollars came in the economy at that time, the rate of interest in USA was low. When you have low rate of interest and you have too much of dollars, these people who had too much of dollar, they started to see around the world that is there a country where the rate of interest is high. So they saw that in India at that time, the rate of interest was slightly higher. So what did they do? They took all their dollars and they came to India in the form of foreign investment, right? So a lot of foreign institutional investment, hot money came to India. In India, they started to make a lot of profits, so they stayed. Around the year 2013, the US Fed, it signaled to people, it, it passed on a message to people that US Fed might not buy a lot of bonds. This was just a message. So what was the expectation in people? Now look at these people. These are the people in USA. They thought that, oh my God, what has happened? Now Fed will not buy our bonds. So that expectation was set in the market that supply of bond will increase, right? Because, because Fed is not going to buy the bonds. So there will be excess bond in the market. When you have excess of something, its value goes down, which means bond price goes down. So in the expectation that there will be excess supply of bond in the market, actually the bond price went down. When the bond price went down, the bond yield went up. There is an inverse relationship between bond price and bond yield. When the bond price goes down, bond yield goes up. When the bond yield went up, so these people who had invested money in India, FII, hot money, they saw that, oh, the bond yield in USA is increasing. They quickly took all their dollars from India and they went to USA. Right? Because the rate of interest increased in USA, bond yield was higher in USA, so they all went back to USA. What happened in India? All of a sudden, India realized that there is a problem. We had so much of dollar, all of a sudden, all the dollar is gone. Right? So, so what happened in India? India became vulnerable. And when we lost all the dollars, our foreign exchange reserves came down. And for survival also, we started to borrow a lot of money. So our debt started to increase. Plus, you see something very interesting. At the time, when, when the dollar went away from India, so our inflation was 10 to 11 percent, worrisome. Current account deficit 5 to 6 percent, very high. GDP 5 percent. So GDP rate of growth was not very high. It was 5 percent. But look at this thing. It's called as debt to GDP ratio 23.9 percent. This is worrisome. I'll tell you why. Now imagine a scenario where income is 100 rupees, which means you are earning 100 rupees. Out of your 100 rupees income, suppose, you have to return 24 or 25 rupees to somebody because you had taken a loan from someone. So suppose your income is 100 rupees and you had taken a loan from me worth 25 rupees. So out of 100 rupees, you have to give 25 rupees to me. What is left in your hand? 75 rupees. 
This was the situation of India, debt to GDP ratio. Debt means something which we have to return because you have taken it from someone. So our debt to GDP ratio was almost 23.9, which means 24%. One fourth of our GDP was our debt, which means that is what we have to return. This made us fragile. Now the worrisome part of being a fragile economy is once you become a fragile economy, you keep on becoming more vulnerable and, and fragile. I'll give you an example. So suppose that you are physically not very strong and COVID attacks you because COVID attacks your immunity system. Once COVID attacks you, it starts to break down your immunity even further. And then you become prone to many more infections. You would have heard during COVID that people had developed different kind of uh, fungal infection, etc, etc. Why? Because our body becomes even weaker. So the moment an economic situation arises where the macroeconomic fundamentals of a country become weaker then we become fragile once we become fragile we become even more weaker so recovery becomes very painful that is what happened in india so taper tantrum happened we became fragile when we became fragile we started to become even more weaker let me show you how so this I have already explained that India became, you know, fragile five. Now let me point out just one thing from this list, which will show you that once you become fragile, you keep on becoming even more fragile. See, this is US and this is India. When things were fine, what was happening? Dollar from US was coming to India, foreign investment. When dollars from US reaches India, our foreign exchange reserve goes up. And this is a good thing. Why? When your foreign exchange reserve is high, it means that you are so strong as an economy that if you need to import something, you don't need to worry because your Reserve Bank of India has good foreign exchange reserve. We can keep on importing for months and months without worrying because when you import, you pay dollars, right? And if your Reserve Bank of India has huge foreign exchange reserve, means huge reservoir of dollars, you need not worry. So when from US, the foreign exchange reserves was building up because dollars was coming to India, India was slowly becoming stronger. But the moment taper tantrum happened and then we became fragile. So what happened in US, the interest rate increased and from India, the foreign portfolio investment FPI, it started to return back to USA. Why? Because in USA, the rate of interest and the bond yield started to increase. This is called capital flight. So after taper tantrum, when we became fragile, money from India started to go back to US, which means our foreign exchange reserve started to reduce. When your foreign exchange reserve reduces, your import cover also reduces. What is import cover? Import cover means the number of months or the time period for which you can keep on importing in the economy using your foreign exchange reserves. So suppose we have a foreign exchange reserve of $100. For how many months can you sustain your import? That is the, with, with this $100, that is the meaning of import cover. So imagine that if our foreign exchange reserve is just $100, with $100 you can import for let's say one month, then one month is called as the import cover. So it's the duration for which you can sustain imports using your forex reserves. So when your forex reserves fell, your import cover also fell. That means you became vulnerable. Now imagine if India would have been in a situation around 2013 that we needed to import medicine and food, right? Because of, because of some situation, but our import cover was down because our forex was down. How would have India imported medicine and food if required at that time? So India became even more vulnerable. So once you become vulnerable, the danger is you keep on becoming more vulnerable, right? So this is your fragile five. Now, let me, let me also tell you two very, very important things, which will give you a very good idea about how strong or weak Indian economy is in terms of, you know, capability to face crisis. You see, if for some reason, you keep on borrowing a lot of money. So, so when we meet, suppose I check your wallet and I see that in your wallet, there is one lakh rupees. I will ask you a question that, how did you get this one lakh rupees? Suppose you tell me that, you know, you got this one lakh rupees 
by, by borrowing it from somebody. Now, instead of being happy, I would be worried for you. Why? Because if you keep on borrowing 1 lakh rupees, 5 lakh rupees, 10 lakh rupees, for the time being, you would be happy that you have the money in your wallet. But it's worrisome because a situation might arise when you have to return all this money and suppose you have already spent it. You don't have it in your wallet now. So you take 1 lakh rupees from somebody and you spend it. That somebody comes and says, return my money. You don't have it. It's a worrisome situation, right? So if in an economy, there is a situation where we borrow a lot, then it's dangerous because if we have to return it and we are not able to return it, then we will become fragile. We will become even more vulnerable to crisis, isn't it? So there are two ways in which you can check whether you are fragile and vulnerable and how strong you are in terms of, you know, capital and finances, right? So one of the ways to check if you are very strong in terms of money is to look at something called as net international investment position and second is external debt. Now what is net international investment position? I'll give you an example. Suppose you are the owner of a company, all right? So what will you do? You, you will issue a bond, isn't it? Now suppose I have 100 rupees in my pocket. I will come to you and I will buy your bond. When I buy your bond, I will give you 100 rupees and you will promise me that after some time, maybe one year, you will return my 100 rupees plus you will also give me some interest rate. Isn't it? So this is our deal. You give me a bond, I give you 100 rupees. After one year, you give me 100 rupees, you return my 100 rupees plus some interest rate. For me, bond is an asset. Why? Because when I invested in bond, I made sure that I earned profit, I earned interest rate. So that's, that's an asset for me, isn't it? So this investment is an investment in financial asset. But for you, you took my 100 rupees by selling me bond. So this bond is a liability for you because today you took 100 rupees from me, tomorrow you have to return my 100 rupees plus interest rate also. So when I invest in financial assets, it's an asset for me, but it's a liability for you. Right? So, so why is India popular? India is very famous globally because the assets that Indians have is always less than the liability, which means we always have to return more to others and we always earn less. This is our situation. So what is the meaning of net international investment position? Net international investment position means financial assets that Indians own minus the financial liabilities of India, which means the sources of income that we have minus what we have to return to somebody. So we always have to return more to somebody. We always earn less. So most of the time, our net international investment position is negative only, which means we always have to give more to people, right? But over the period of time, this is, this is interesting. Over the period of past few years, despite the fact that we are going through a COVID kind of, of scenario, our net international investment position is becoming better. Which means even today it is bad. But few years back it was worse, now it is bad. Right? So lesser of the two evils. So, so yesterday it was pathetic, then it became worrisome, now it is bad. Right, so it's improving. It's still negative, but it is improving. So I'll show you how. See, earlier, this was our liability. Suppose this circle is liability, which means we have to return this amount to somebody. Asset means this gives us income. So our asset was small, liability was large. Now what is the scenario? See, our liability is coming down, which means we have to return less now compared to earlier. So it's a good thing, isn't it? Liability is still there, but our liability is coming down. Look at the assets. Assets are expanding a bit. Not, not in a great way, but yes, they are expanding. Which means liability is coming down, assets are expanding just a little bit. Let me show you this through a graph. Look at this. Look at the right side first. So if you take the ratio of asset to liability, as I told you, our liability is coming down and our assets are going up which means this ratio of asset to liability, it is going up. Since it is going up, our net 
international investment position see net international investment position it is improving a bit see earlier for example in the year 2019 just before covid this was our net international investment position look how bad it is it is so negative look at this it is negative it's less see this is zero line so it is less than zero now what has happened now it is becoming less negative see it is less negative it's improving so 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 for example look at this slowly it is improving isn't it so earlier it was hugely negative now it is less negative less negative less negative and why is it becoming less negative because our asset to liability ratio is improving so if somebody will ask you that is india becoming more resilient or stronger in terms of our asset and liability ratio we should say yes looking at this trend that it is still bad but it is less bad now all right so that's one way of looking at india now let us look at external debt as i told you that two ways to measure the resilience of the economy is one you look at net international investment position because it gives you an idea about how much you have to give to somebody versus how much you have how much you earn similarly this external debt is a very important factor why because what is the meaning of debt debt means something which you owe to somebody right so we can study debt in two heads number one what is the composition of debt like how does the debt of india look like and second whether our debt is expressed in dollars or rupee whether we take more dollars as borrowings or we take more rupee as borrowings what is our debt now first let me tell you what is this debt this external debt means when as a country we borrow from outside india that is called external debt now if you borrow from outside india you can borrow in either dollars or you can borrow in rupee when you borrow in dollars it is called as dollar denominated debt our dollar denominated debt is very high when you borrow in rupee it is called as rupee denominated debt very simple i'll give you an example of dollar and rupee denominated debt so guys suppose that i am an indian company all right now i sell a bond in usa right the price of the bond is one dollar so what will a us citizen give me if i sell a bond to them they will give me one dollar simple so that is called as dollar denominated debt but suppose i am an indian company and i am selling a debt in usa for 10 rupees mind you not dollar but 10 rupees so a us citizen buys that bond and pays me 10 rupees that is called as rupee denominated debt simple isn't it so our rupee denominated debt over a period of time has increased which means we have been able to sell bonds etc in our own currency so our rupee denominated debt is increasing our dollar denominated debt is also increasing but typically our dollar denominated debt is higher than rupee denominated debt similarly guys let me show you one more thing so do you know this that if an nri so this is usa and this guy is an nri so this nri earns income in usa isn't it he earns income in usa so what does he do he sends his income to india because he is earning the income outside india if he sends the income to india he will keep his income in some bank account so which bank account does he open that bank account is called as nre what is nre non resident external account it is called as nre so suppose this 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 guy nri he transfers his income to an indian account called as nre account and he puts rupee in this account nre account is filled with rupee and this income he has earned outside india right so since this income belongs to him but he is putting it in indian account
he can take it back any time. So it's not India's money, right? It's not India's money. It's his money. He's putting it in India in form of rupee. He can take it back any time. So the money which is there in the Indian account is a debt for India because we have to return it whenever he asks. That is not our asset. That is our liability. He's putting the money because he's saying, I want to keep money in your account, but tomorrow I might come and take back everything. So that's a debt. So this NRE account and rupee deposited in it over the period of time it increased in fact during covid we saw a lot of nris they transferred their income to nre accounts in india so what do we see we have seen that our external debt in the form of dollars has increased our external debt in the form of rupee has also increased and one of the ways one of the reasons because of which our you know external debt in the form of rupee has increased is because nris have deposited a lot of Cash in NRE account, non-resident external account. Fine. So these kind of informations might be asked in UPSC prelims. Now let's look at this external debt component wise, which means why do we borrow money from outside India? So let's look at some of the reasons. See, this is what I was talking about. So, so the top three reasons because of which we borrow money from outside India. The big three reasons are commercial borrowings. So for example, if I am an industrialist in India and if I have to expand my industry, one of the reasons that I borrow from outside India is because I have to expand my industry, commercial reasons. So I will issue a bond and I will borrow from outside India. So commercial reasons. Second is NRI deposits. As I told you, NRIs deposit their income in Indian accounts also. So NRI deposits. Third is short term trade credit. I'll give you an example. So suppose guys, I am buying a mobile phone in USA, right? Why? Because I am a trader in India who will sell the mobile phone in India. So I am buying mobile phone in USA. The price of the mobile phone is, so, so I have bought a truck full of mobile phones. So the price of the entire truck full of mobile phone is 50 lakh rupees, right? But I don't have cash, so I won't be able to make the payment in USA. So I will tell the US supplier that you please hold on. I will make the payment after one month or two days, three days, one week. That is called a short term trade credit. So when an Indian buyer buys something in a foreign country and we don't make the payment immediately, we make the payment after a few days, a week or something. So that is called a short term credit. Over time, short term credit has come down. You must remember this for UPSC prelims. So in our external debt, our commercial borrowings have increased, NRI deposits have increased, but our short term trade credit has come down. And overall, if you look at the entire external debt of India, suppose the entire external debt of India is $100, which means India has taken $100 from other parts of the world. So out of $100, these three are the main reasons that we take this money. So their contribution, the contribution of these three is almost 78%. So out of $100 that we borrow from outside India, $78 are because of these three reasons. So a majority of money that we borrow from outside is because of commercial borrowing, NRA deposit, short term trade credit. Fine, this might be asked in UPSC. And I, as I was telling you about external debt, that you can look at external debt in the form of currency composition also. So when we borrow money from outside India, either it is in the form of dollars. So yes, we have borrowed a lot of you know, money from outside India in the form of dollar, it has increased. We have also borrowed money outside India in the form of rupee, like foreign portfolio investments. They have bought bonds in India and those bonds are expressed in rupee. So when I am an Indian company, I am selling a bond which is expressed in rupee. It is called as rupee denominated bond. So their sale has also increased plus the NRE rupee account. So when the NRIs put their income in the Indian accounts in the form of rupee, it is called NRE rupee account. That has also increased. So now guys, the most important question that we were trying to examine since quite some time was, are we resilient enough, right? So are we strong enough compared to what we were a few years back? That is the question. So let's see, let's look at the overall analysis now. So guys, how do you know if you are strong enough, as we had discussed some time back, 
whenever a crisis comes what is the way in which you respond to crisis how ready are you to face a crisis that shows how resilient you are as an economy so what are the three different type of crisis that you are already aware of one global financial crisis 2008 and 9 second uh, you know taper tantrum 2013 and one is the covid crisis which is continuing as we speak today so let us compare some of the macro economic fundamentals of india during the global financial crisis of 2008 2009 then we compare the macro economic fundamentals of india with taper tantrum and then the macro economic fundamentals of india during the covid crisis so see these are some of the macro economic indicators of india we are going to look at how these indicators behaved during global financial crisis during taper tantrum and during covid crisis this will give us an idea whether indian economy has become stronger over the period of time to face crisis all right so the first thing that we are going to look at is external debt to gdp i told you what is external debt the money that we borrow from abroad is external debt so external debt to gdp ratio of india during global financial crisis was 20.7% this ratio taper tantrum 23.9% covid 20.1% so if you compare taper tantrum and covid situation you would see that our external debt to gdp ratio is in a good position right so if you compare these two then yes currently we are doing better we are able to face the the crisis like situation in a much better manner because our debt is lower if you look at forex reserves during global financial crisis forex reserve was 252 billion dollars then taper tantrum 304 billion dollars and currently 633 billion dollars so yes if you compare taper tantrum with covid crisis our forex exchange reserves are also good so i'll put a star over here that yes we are doing good now let us compare reserves to short term debt so when you borrow money for a small period of time right so that is called short term debt so if you compare the ratio of reserves to short term debt so it was 270 during global financial crisis then taper tantrum 171 currently 248 so in this aspect the 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 reserves to short term debt has increased all right so see then import covers means for how long can india keep on importing using its foreign exchange reserves so global financial crisis 9.8 months taper tantrum 7.8 months and covid 14.6 months which means if we use our foreign exchange reserves of 633 billion we can keep importing in india for a period of almost 14.6 months which means for 15 months we can keep importing right so this is the scenario now <clears throat> let's look at the debt service ratio what is debt service ratio guys you know i'll give you an example suppose you take 100 rupees from me now you take this money as a loan and you promise me that you are going to return this money after one year and you are also going to pay me a rate of interest of 10% so what is the principal what is the money that you took from me that is 100 rupees that is called principal but what will you return to me you will return 100 plus interest rate so if you borrow more you have to return more money more principal and more interest rate right that is called debt service debt service means servicing of debt servicing of debt means you have to return the principal and the interest so if you borrow more you have to return more which means if the debt service ratio is very high it means country has taken more loan hence we have to return more interest rate we have to return more principal and it's not a good thing so the debt to service ratio of india during global financial crisis 4.4 during taper tantrum 5.9 and during covid 4.7 right see so things have improved compared to taper tantrum if you look at net iip to gdp ratio so so what is iip international investment position i told you remember that when indians invest in assets that's a good thing but if our liability is more which means we have to return more money that's not a healthy sign so our net iip 
to GDP ratio, I told you over time it is becoming better. So, so during global financial crisis, it was minus 5.8, then taper tantrum 18, minus 18.2, now minus 11.3. So, see, it is still negative, but it is less negative now, which means it is improving. So, if you compare taper tantrum with COVID situation, you see in, in almost all the macroeconomic indicators, we have shown better position, right? So, so it, what does it mean? It means that even though Indian economy is suffering from crisis, our macroeconomic indicators or fundamentals are slightly better, which means that we have been able to, to handle or withstand crisis in a more bold manner. It doesn't mean that we have not been impacted by crisis. We have been impacted by crisis, but the way we have reacted in terms of economic performance, it has been slightly better than how we used to react in 2013, 14, 15 or 16, right? So currently we are reacting in a much bolder and much better manner. This is what the message is, right? One thing which the economic survey doesn't tell you, I'm going to, to throw some light on that. If you look at India's performance during global financial crisis, see our external debt to GDP 20.7, currently 20.1, almost similar. Our forex reserves were, yes, very low at that time. Today it is higher. Yes, that's a difference, which is a good thing. And in fact, it's a very interesting thing that despite having COVID, when the entire world is suffering from lack of capital, India was able to attract a lot of foreign investment. So yes, it's a good thing. Reserve to short term debt 270, 248, again similar. Import cover 9.8 months, 14.6 months. Yes, there's a difference. Debt to service 4.4 and here is 4.7. Here your net IIP to GDP minus 5.8. It's good. Now it's minus 11.3. So what do you observe? That even during global financial crisis of 2008 and 9, India was able to handle it much more strongly compared to what the experts thought India would do. So the experts thought that India would crumble a lot, we would suffer a lot. Yes, we did suffer, but the suffering was way less than what others had predicted that it would happen. So yes, during global financial crisis, we were impacted. But in terms of these selected macroeconomic indicators, our performance at that time and during COVID is not very, very different. Taper tantrum and COVID, very different. But global financial crisis and this, in many of the things, it's quite close, isn't it? So it's, it's good to see that Indian economy is becoming more resilient again. Fine. Now I want to show you something more. See, so, so now I want to compare taper tantrum and COVID in terms of few other things, which will give you a better idea of how resilient Indian economy is. So if you look at inflation, during taper tantrum, our inflation was 10 to 11 percent. During COVID, 5.5 to 6.2 percent. So see, in terms of inflation, we have been able to keep inflation in check. In terms of current account deficit, taper tantrum 5 to 6 percent, current account deficit, COVID 0.2 percent. So see, it's much better. In terms of GDP, our rate of growth of GDP was 5 percent during taper tantrum, currently 9.2 percent during COVID 2021. So it's, it's much better. Debt to GDP ratio 23.9 and here it is 20.1. So yes, it is better. So if you look at all the macroeconomic indicators and, and macroeconomic fundamentals, you would see that we have been able to handle the COVID kind of crisis and the situation much more strongly than how we used to handle crisis situations earlier. So in that sense, yes, the economic survey says that Indian economy has become much more resilient. All right. Now, guys, let us discuss some of the important schemes and initiatives by government of India to promote export and to promote trade in general. A very, very important question because this can be directly asked in, in interviews, in prelims and in mains. So see. The first scheme is called as remission of duties and taxes on exported products, RODTEP. What is this scheme? So suppose guys in India, there is a company which is exporting goods, right? When you manufacture something and you export, there are many taxes and duties which are imposed on you. Some of the taxes and duties are reimbursed or returned by government of India, central government and state government. But there are many taxes and duties 
which a producer pays during production distribution which is not reimbursed to them example electricity duty so suppose there is a company in india which is manufacturing something let's say mobile phones so so they they use electricity right so they pay electricity duty when they transport their mobile phones using different means of transportation so they have to pay you know vat on fuel used in transportation and what is the fuel they use petrol and diesel on that they pay vat similarly you know they pay mandi tax or stamp duty so these are some of the taxes and duties which are imposed on the on the exporter and producers in india which is not reimbursed by central or state government now government of india said that if we don't reimburse these taxes and duties indian goods which means goods which have been made in india it will become very costly in the global market and it will not be competitive nobody will buy it so this scheme was launched by government of india under which these taxes example these electricity uh, duty vat on fuel etc these are reimbursed to the producer so that our goods become competitive in the global market now let's look at the second scheme district as export hub so you know what government of india has done now government of india has said that in every district of india there will be a creation of district export promotion committee and what will be the job of this committee dpc this committee is going to identify if there are any goods or services which are produced within a district which can be exported right so they are basically trying to find out those goods and services which we can identify which can be exported out of india so that our export becomes more diversified because we are hardly exporting a few selected things government of india wants that india should export diversified things and whose responsibility is it to identify what we can export district export promotion committee now see you have heard of of this name called exim bank what is exim bank export import bank right what do they do if i am an exporter in india or i am an importer in india and if i am in need of capital or money which bank can i approach exim bank but exim bank ran through a rough phase they also needed cash so the government of india infused capital in the exim bank almost 750 crore rupees in the exim bank by buying shares from them so what did government of india do government of india put more money in the exim bank and in return government of india took some shares now what will exim bank do exim bank is going to give these this money to exporters and importers this will promote trade in india now guys let us look at this interesting scheme called as export promotion capital goods scheme a very very interesting scheme i'll tell you a story and you should be careful about the details of the story you see let's start the story with somebody who is manufacturing automobile in india so suppose this guy has a factory in india right and in that factory he is manufacturing automobiles to manufacture automobile in india he needs a particular machine all right a capital good machine is a capital good where does he get this machine from so suppose this guy who is the factory owner he buys the machine from usa machine is called as capital good right whenever you buy something from a foreign country you have to pay custom duties right so when this guy buys capital goods from usa he is supposed to give custom duties to the government of india suppose the value of custom duty is 100 rupees the government of india says that under under you know different schemes that the government runs government gives different kind of incentives to the to the manufacturers in india so government of india tells him that look you are supposed to pay 100 rupees as custom duty we will waive it off you don't need to pay it we will give you this liberty that you don't need to pay 100 rupees as custom duty under only one condition that if we allow you not to pay 100 rupees as custom duty in return you have to make sure that when you manufacture automobile in india you must export at least 90 rupees worth of automobile outside india so whatever you save as custom duties you have to take 90% of it so if you save 100 rupees as custom duty 90% of 100 is 90 rupees so you must promise that you should export 
नाइंटी रुपीज वर्थ ऑफ ऑटोमोबाइल आउटसाइड इंडिया सो यू सेव हंड्रेड बट इन रिटर्न यू हैव टू एक्सपोर्ट नाइंटी रुपीज वर्थ ऑफ ऑटोमोबाइल आउटसाइड इंडिया सो दिस यूज टू बी द स्कीम गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इंट्रोड्यूस दिस एक्सपोर्ट प्रमोशन कैपिटल गुड स्कीम एंड सेड दैट येस दिस विल कॉन्टिन्यू बट यू हैव वन मोर ऑप्शन नाउ सो इफ यू आर एन ऑटोमोबाइल मैन्युफैक्चर इन इंडिया फॉर एग्जाम्पल दिस कुड बी एनी इंडस्ट्री laptop mobile phone automobile anything so suppose this guy same guy who who was importing the capital goods from usa government tells him that hey look you need capital goods in india itself in northeast of india let's say in arunachal pradesh there is a factory which is manufacturing the same capital good that you need so this guy needs some machine that machine is being manufactured within india so government tells him that if you buy this machine within india from an indian manufacturer we will not ask you to pay excise duties when do you pay excise duties excise duties are paid when something is produced in india so since these capital goods that he needs to manufacture his car he needs some machines those machines are being manufactured in india so the government says if you buy it in india within india then you don't need to pay excise duties so excise duty will be zero and otherwise the excise duty would have been 100 rupees but for you it is zero in return you have to promise just one thing that whatever excise duty you save if you buy something within india you have to take 75% of this excise duty so what is 75% of 100 rupees 75 rupees so the government of india says whatever excise duty you save take 75% of it and you promise to government of india that when you ma manufacture automobile you will export minimum 75 rupees worth of automobile outside india so this is the scheme so see if if this guy who is the factory owner of automobile in india if he imports capital goods from usa or other countries minimum export commitment is 90% of what he saves as custom duty but if he buys the same thing within india his export commitment minimum export commitment would only be 75% of what he saves as excise duty right so he can compare whatever suits he can do and why has the government launched this side of the scheme because government wants indian manufacturers to buy capital goods within india for that reason government has launched this scheme all right now the next scheme is called as production linked incentive scheme what is production linked incentive scheme i'll give you a very basic example now government of india says that there are many industries and many sectors in india who have the potential to become global companies and global players for example india always had this dream that we wanted to become the global powerhouse of electronics similarly currently india wants to become a global player and manufacturer of pharmaceuticals similarly textile food processing industry these are the things in which india wants to become an exporter of the world right so government of india has said that government is going to provide extra incentive and support to some selected sectors in india so that they can become exporters at a global level this will help us in two ways it will help us to earn foreign exchange it will help in the creation of employment within india and india will become a manufacturing hub how does the scheme operate so in the year 2021 when government of india introduced the budget 2021 they said that 13 sectors would be covered so in the year 2021 13 sectors were announced by government of india that 13 sectors would be covered under the scheme called production linked incentive how would the scheme work i'll give you a very you know basic idea of the scheme so suppose this is a factory what is this factory doing this factory is manufacturing ice creams and and food processing industry is one of the sectors in this 13 sectors so how does this 13 sector look like so food processing textile pharmaceutical etc etc right so suppose this is a factory which manufactures ice cream so the government of india says we will promote you only if you qualify certain minimum conditions example so the government of india says that government of india is going to ask this this company ice cream manufacturing company that what was their sale figure in the year 2020 for example so sale sale figure of this ice cream manufacturing company in the year 2020 is 100 crore rupees 
Now the government of India will ask the sale figure in the year 2021. This is just an example so that you understand the scheme. So in the year 2021, the sale figure is 140 crore. Now, government of India says that since your sale figure has increased by 40 crore and government feels 40 crore is a good increase. So the government of India announces that they are going to give some incentive to this ice cream factory. How much incentive will be given? Incentives could vary. It could be 4%, 5%, 10%, 11%, anything. For example, the government might say that I will give you 10% incentive. How is the incentive given? Whatever is the extra sale, see extra sale is 40 crore. So 10% of extra sale is calculated. 10% of 40 crore is 4 crore. This 4 crore is given to this food processing industry as subsidy. So this 4 crore is given in the accounts of this company. And how does this company use this 4 crore? This company uses this 4 crore in buying better raw material, creating the better quality product, isn't it? So buying better machines, improving production, improving volume of production. So employment will increase and exports out of India will increase. This is what is going to be the effect of production linked incentives and India might become a global powerhouse. All right, global manufacturing hub. So, so this is your production linked incentives. Now trade deals. Do you know something that government of India has been signing a lot of trade deals with other countries? I'll give you some examples. So examples of trade deals are preferential trade agreement, free trade agreement, comprehensive economic cooperation agreement, comprehensive economic partnership agreement, etc. Government of India has been signing a lot of trade. What is the meaning of trade deal? See, government of India wants to have very good trade relationship with Australia, UK, USA, European Union, etc, etc. So how does the trade deal look like? Suppose this is USA and this is India. Now if both these countries sign a trade deal, trade deal could be of any type, PTA, FTA, CCA, CPA, etc. So if they sign a trade deal, now what will happen? One of the basic things that will happen. So if India will export anything to USA, right? Suppose India exports, you know, ice cream to USA. Now USA will not impose high tariffs on Indian ice cream. USA will impose very low tariffs, low import duties on Indian goods. The import duties might be very low, might be zero. So our goods will easily enter the US market and US will impose very small amount of import duties or tariffs on Indian goods. Similarly, when USA sends something to India, we will also impose low import duties or low tariffs on the US goods. This will help in the increase of trade relationship and trade bond between two countries like India and USA. So now guys, let us understand a new scheme by government of India called as PM Gati Shakti. And let us see what is the role of PM Gati Shakti in promoting India's export and India's trade. I'll give you some examples to understand what is PM Gati Shakti. See, let's, let's take an example from real life. Have you ever seen that wherever you stay, there are very nice roads in your, in your area, around your house. There are streets where there are beautiful roads there, right? They are not damaged, they are okay, they are good roads. All of a sudden you see one day that somebody has come and they are digging up the road, right? And if you ask them why are you digging up the road, they will tell you that we are digging up the road because we want to lay a gas pipeline there. Have you ever encountered it? And, and, and then they will lay the gas pipeline and they will not repair the road for a very long period of time. Don't you think it is wastage of public money? It is absolute wastage of public money. Now there could be another situation, I'll give you another example. Suppose government of India has constructed a road in a particular area. After three months, Ministry of Environment and Forest comes and says that remove this road because this road is encroaching upon an ecologically sensitive zone. So Ministry of Road and Transportation would say that why didn't you tell this earlier? So Ministry of, of Environment and Forest would say because you did not talk to us earlier. What do you observe? Do you observe that there can be a situation whereby two different departments of government of India who are indulging in the creation of infrastructure, they are not coordinating amongst each other, they are not talking to each other. 
Hence, when one department creates an infrastructure, other department comes and destroys it. And they both start to fight. There is a friction, isn't it? So there, there are interdepartmental lack of communication and coordination. Don't you think it will take us one step ahead and five steps backwards? You construct a road, you destroy the road, isn't it? So, so these are some of the governance related issues. Point number two. Now guys, suppose in this diagram, let me show you something interesting. So suppose in this diagram, this is a map of India. All right, so imagine that this is India. Now suppose that here you have a factory. This factory manufactures automobile. This automobile has to be exported to USA. How will you, how will you take this automobile to USA? So from this factory, the automobile will be transported through road to the seaport here. From this seaport, it will be loaded in the container and a ship will take it to USA. There could be another situation. Now suppose that you have a factory here. So from this factory, let's say it is in Uttarakhand or Himachal Pradesh and in those areas. So from, from those places, suppose processed food is coming and it is to be exported to USA. So there is a railway network. Through the railway network, the ready-made products are exported to the nearest seaport and from here it is exported. Similarly, suppose that in this area, the Bengal area, suppose something is being prepared in West Bengal. From there, it is to be exported to other countries. How will you export it? So, so for example, we can have an airport here and through the airport flight services, we can export our goods to other countries from West Bengal. What did you observe? Did you observe that we need multimodal connectivity? We need a strong connectivity so that our ports, airport, railway and road all are connected with each other in an efficient manner. So that if you need to use road, railway or airport, they are all ready, right? So we need to create an infrastructure system where there is interconnectedness between different means of transportation, infrastructure, so that the movement of goods become smooth, isn't it? Who will ensure it? How will you make sure that if there is a railway, it must be connected to ports, it must be connected to airport, how will you make sure that these connections happen? How will you make sure that Ministry of Railway coordinates with Ministry of Civil Aviation, right? So for that thing, Government of India introduced a scheme called as PM Gati Shakti. What is PM Gati Shakti? So in PM Gati Shakti, Government of India has said that there are 16 ministries which are involved in infrastructure creation in India. So the government says that all the 16 ministries will have to coordinate with each other. They have to inform each other about what projects they are going to take in future and what projects they are currently running. So this coordination will solve a problem of India that if one department is creating an infrastructure, other will not come and interfere and disturb it. So there will be a smooth creation of infrastructure through interdepartmental coordination and cooperation. This will help us to create world-class infrastructure, right? So this is your PM, Gati Shakti. Now guys, the next important reform that the government of India has undertaken to promote trade and export is in the field of logistics. Now what is logistics? I'll give you an example. Now suppose guys that you belong to USA, right? And you are trying to send something to India. You are trying to send laptops to India, which means you are trying to export laptops. When your laptop reaches India, the Indian officials will do a quality check. Some paperwork will be done, right? Custom clearance has to be given. Suppose all these things are done manually. How many days and months will it take to get custom clearances and paperwork done? It might take weeks, months, etc. So don't you think that in this era of trade, things should be more digital, isn't it? Yes. Now, if government of India makes sure that we create rules and regulations where we promote digital transactions, digital filling of forms, etc., etc., don't you feel it will save a lot of time? Yes. So these steps which are taken by the government of India in the field of making the trade smooth is called as trade facilitation. Similarly, suppose guys that you are an exporter within India and what are you exporting? Suppose you are exporting mangoes to USA. 
right now when you are trying to export mangoes to usa you will package them you will take it to airport or seaport from there you will do the paperwork then you are going to send it to usa suppose in the process of paperwork etc it is so tough it is it is so time taking that you feel frustrated what will you say you will say that the government of india is not you know facilitating you to promote exports isn't it so across the world when we travel to countries we do a survey and we check whether the governments of different countries are taking steps to promote trade when we do this survey across the world then we give a score to the countries that which country is taking more steps to promote trade right then we give them scores that score is used to compare countries that which country this year has taken the maximum efforts to promote trade and who does all these things these things are done by united nation economic and social commission for asia pacific so what do they do every two years they do a survey on digital and sustainable trade facilitation which means how many steps have been taken by a government to promote trade and facilitate trade they do a survey every two years in the survey done in the year 2021 58 trade related measures trade facilitation measures were examined right how many trade facilitation measures 58 who gave these trade facilitation measures wto according to wto government should take 58 trade facilitation measures so this united nation economic and social commission they went to 143 economies of the world and they tried to find out that out of these 58 trade facilitation measures how many measures were adopted by a particular country and they divided these 58 trade facilitation measures into the following indicators transparency related steps formalities you know institutional arrangement and cooperation cross border paperless trade so they were trying to examine that in these four aspects covering these 58 measures how were different countries of the world performing india's score in this was 90.3 percentage which is very very good and you would be surprised to know that based on this score of india we got three amazing results that 90.3% is the score of india in the trade facilitation measure and because of this score india is better than the countries in south asia and southwest asia so if you compare the countries in south asia and southwest asia india emerges to be the best country according to this survey which took a lot of st steps to promote trade similarly if you talk about the countries in asia pacific region india emerges to be the best country after this survey that yes india took maximum steps to promote trade in fact the surprising thing is that when you look at the steps taken by india to promote trade as i told you through digital transaction remove paperwork and make everything digital to reduce paperwork formalities you know speed up the process if you look at all the things that india did in fact india's performance was better than some countries like france uk canada norway and european union in terms of the steps that we took to promote trade so if upsc asks you a question that what are the steps that has been taken by india to promote trade you should say that these are the steps and these are the explanations give very brief explanation in upsc don't write too much uh, you know you should be very economical with words fine so this was the chapter on uh, you know balance of payment and external sector we would meet very soon with the new topic on economic survey thanks a lot